With my gorgeous brother Lewis in town, I'm inspired to share with you the story of Mary and Kate. And I must start by saying that my brother Lewis is the most kind, thoughtful, generous and naturally gregarious man I know. He works in IT and has resided in Europe with stints in Asia and the US for over two decades. So in early 2000, after the death of my grandmother, my brother Lewis and myself, we were consumed by the guilt the frustration and the sorrow of her long and drawn out decline and we wanted to face our own fears around death and dying and so we volunteered our time at the hospice in downtown London. The old and the dying they don't get visitors often and so isolation and loneliness haunt them in their final days. We visited the hospice weekly and had the chance to get to know people who only had a very short time to live. In fact, most only had a few weeks to live. And we learned so much during this time. A hospice is a place where the sick go to die. When the doctors have exhausted all hope of saving them, in hospice patients, there is no more fighting to survive. There's only surrender. And because of this, the place is stripped of pretense and facade. It is a place free of egocentric behavior. Transparency and honesty prevails. My brother Lewis is livelier than I am. He also loves to cook. And so the hospice manager allowed us to visit every Friday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. to perform cooking demonstrations. And Lewis was able to get so many of the residents involved in the preparation and the cooking, and we all ate together afterwards. Lewis has this beautiful knack of making people laugh. He always injects a room with pure energy everywhere that he goes. When Lewis is on, he is on. I, on the other hand, prefer to sit quietly in the corner, observing, journaling, taking it all in, watching my brother in action and assisting silently. What touched us the most was seeing how much the residents came out of their shells during our visits. We realized the most poignant room in the hospice was the kitchen, which was indeed a huge revelation for us considering that most of the residents could eat very little, if anything at all. The first time Lewis cooked spring rolls, the old residents who usually sit there in their wheelchairs and stare at the ceilings or the walls actually participated in the rolling of the spring rolls. And it was a delight providing sustenance for the residents on so many levels, including their sense of smell, their sense of taste, of touch and play. These were primal sensorial delights. Lewis and I attended to the dignity of the senses by way of the body, impulses that helped them stay present. And if only for a short period of time, they didn't think about their past or their future. And we learnt that as long as we have our senses, even just one of our senses, we have at least the possibility of accessing what makes us feel human and feel connected. We also learnt that no matter how old we get, we all crave human connection to feel like we are a part of something. And we learnt that as we get older, we do not lose our innate characteristics such as competitiveness, humor, and grace. And it made Lewis and I so happy when the staff told him how much the residents were looking forward to his visits. The staff also admitted that his visits added so much laughter to their usual somber routines. His visits were the times when the most number of staff turned up to work. When the residents were wrapping spring rolls, they made fun of each other. They made fun of each other's rolling skills and tried to beat each other, to roll faster than the other. And Lewis and I would steal secret glances at each other and giggle because the residents were really old, but they were still so competitive and they wanted to win. It made us sad knowing that they didn't have many magic moments left to share, share their laughter and their joy with one another. And I remember Mary and Kate in particular. Mary was still in the final stages of Alzheimer's and her best friend Kate was dying of cancer. And even though they were frail and weak, they were both excited to wrap the spring rolls. And Mary and Kate, I remember, were an absolute pleasure to be around. Their animated excitement at wrapping the spring rolls gave me glimpses of how playful and cheeky they must have been in their youth. Kate was so incredibly slow but incredibly determined and with her shaky little hands they made these little morsels look more like pasties than like spring rolls. 
Mary teased Kate endlessly. She gave her so much grief for being slow. And I cried silent tears of happiness watching the two of them laughing and giggling together like two young girls getting up to mischief. And one Friday afternoon, Mary told us that Kate was too weak to attend the cooking demonstration. And on the following afternoon, the staff told us that both ladies had passed away. Sometimes the staff, as well as the families of the residents, treated Lewis and I like hired help, <laughs> as if we were there to cook and serve them. They forgot that we were volunteers. They forgot the purpose behind our visits, and we were certainly not there for the staff. We weren't there for them. But we didn't allow ourselves to get affected too much by their bigotry and their ignorance, however, and we reminded each other often to always see the big picture. Lewis didn't like the way the staff spoke to the residents, and I tried to make him feel better and told him that that was probably the way some of the residents needed to be spoken to because for a lot of them, anger, resentment and often rage preceded resignation. Most of the time, our simple presence was enough for the dying. We sat and listened to their stories and we didn't care that some of the stories made no sense at all or that we had heard the same story many, many times before. Some asked to be read to and sang to. Some even asked me to write letters to loved ones on their behalf. Many asked to have their hands held and for me to simply look into their eyes as we sat in silence. You see, people who are dying crave human touch. I often massage the residents' hands, exchanging energy and holding space in stillness. And occasionally, profound conversations emerge. The most interesting conversations were with the younger patients in their 30s and their 40s, and they all possessed a profound clarity at the end of their days. They all admitted that a year prior, they would have never imagined that they would be on their deathbed. They were completely blindsided by their illness. And when I got to know the residents, a similar theme emerged. Nearly all of them had regrets. And when I asked them what they would do differently, they expressed the common themes again and again. The following quotes are my paraphrasing of these conversations and these themes. I wish I had the courage to disappoint my family so I could have lived the life I wanted to live. I wish I wasn't so afraid of upsetting my father. I would have traveled the world after completing university. I would have chosen a different career. My father wanted me to become a lawyer. And so I followed in his footsteps. I hated being a lawyer. I was distressed all the time. Depression was a familiar friend. I wanted to be a photographer and a travel writer. I wanted to be free. If I had my time over, I would have done so many things so differently. Others would tell me, I have so many dreams unfulfilled. My whole life, I was the gunner guy. When this happens, I'm gonna do this. When this happens, I'm gonna do that. Only when this happens, then I'm gonna, gonna, gonna. And I never did any of it. If I knew I would die so soon, I wouldn't have delayed my dreams. I wouldn't have put everyone else's happiness before my own. And now it's too late. Often people would tell me, I wish I laughed more. I wish I wasn't so angry and judgmental all the time. My life was miserable. I was a misery. I wish I had more fun. I wish I had made the effort to do the work on myself and change the patterns and behaviors. If I had done that, I probably would have more friends and been able to create more meaningful relationships. I wish I had the courage to let the toxic fake friends go sooner. I wasted too much time on the wrong people and where are they now? I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I love my business. I love working, but I let it take up too much of my time. I was working for the future. I wrongly assumed that I'd lived into my 80s at least. I wish I'd lived a more exciting life, taken more vacations, embraced more adventures, enjoyed the little things. Many would tell me, I wish I spent more quality time with my wife, my children, my family, my friends. I worked so hard all my life and for what? For what? It kills my heart to know how difficult it will be for them when I am gone. One gentleman said to me, I wish I married the woman I truly loved. I broke Bonnie's heart. 
I married the woman my parents told me to marry and we were never really happy. They tell me Bonnie never got over the pain I caused her. I will ask for her forgiveness in my final hours. I wish I wasn't so stubborn and hateful. I held on to grudges and refused to forgive. I wish I had the strength to let that shit go. I wish I had the courage to tell the people around me that I love them. I wish I made happiness my priority instead of bitterness and revenge. I know for sure that's what made me sick. Anger is a selfish bastard that has robbed me of my precious time. Another person said to me, someone once told me the definition of hell. On my last day on earth, the man I became will meet the man I could have been. If only, if only, if only were the words that I heard most often from the dying. And these must be the two saddest words in the world. And I watched as the pain of regret accelerated the resident's decline. Regret for the things they had done. Regret for the things they had done had alleviated over time, but it was the regret for the things they did not do that left them the most heartbroken. Too often they had love, but they did not say so. It was the words left unsaid, the deeds left undone, and the person they did not become that hurt them the most. The Dalai Lama, when asked what surprised him the most about humanity, he answered, man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money. Then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health. And then he is so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. The result of being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he's never going to die. And then he dies, having never really lived. <laughs>